Christopher Nolikin at Bulger Veterinary Hospital. Hi, I'm Lindsay Benzulo. Talking today about allergies and pets. Spaying and neutering your pet. Pet weight management. And we're going to talk today about pet summer fun and safety. You can... um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but doctor. Mm -hmm. so she says, I You're got good, good girl. You got a lot of treats. A lot of TD treats. Up on that table. <laughs> Hi, welcome back. I am Lindsay Renzulo from Bulger Veterinary Hospital. I'm Christopher Norlikin from Bulger Veterinary Hospital. And this is our first episode of the podcast. You might remember us from the journal. We did shorter segments before, but today is our first day in studio doing a longer show for you, our wonderful clients and customers out there. Um, today, we thought we would utilize this as a great opportunity to really introduce each one of ourselves and tell you a little bit more about where we came from, where we went to school, and a little bit just about our personal professional interests. So I actually am from the area. I'm from, originally from Melrose, Massachusetts. I went to college locally at Stonehill College, and I went to veterinary school at the Atlantic Veterinary College, um, which was wonderful. I had an absolutely wonderful experience up there. Um, after I graduated, I actually went, um, came back home and started working at Bulger Veterinary Hospital, and I've been there for the past almost 10 years, about nine and change at this point. Um, I really do enjoy being a veterinarian. There's many different aspects of my job that I, I bet I love. Um, and some of the, the most important things that I enjoy at work are just sort of the personal relationships that I make between people and their, and their pets. Um, I love doing surgeries and different types of procedures, and I just find it to be a very rewarding career. Um, I do currently a little bit more personally about myself, have um, a husband and three kids, and, um, and a little dog at home named Lola. Uh, so we are very happy and love, love where we are at Bulger Veterinary Hospital. And now I'll introduce Krista and have her tell a little <laughs> bit more about herself. So I'm originally from New Jersey, so don't hate me about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went to college up here at, at MIT <clears throat> in Cambridge and then went back down to Philadelphia for vet school and uh, then just re came back up to the area to join Bulger Veterinary Hospital right out of vet school. Uh, so I've been there for 13 years. Um, I do a little bit of everything just like Lindsay does. We uh, see routine cases, do emergencies, surgery, dentistry, a little bit of everything. Um, and I also have a husband and two kids, um, which is plenty. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a little dog, Lucy, who you've seen on the show before, if you've watched us before. Two cats, two fish tanks, and two guinea pigs. And you probably have noticed that we actually have an honorary guest today. I don't know if you can see it if the camera is down far enough, but uh, Sebastian, one of uh, Dr. Vernalikin's kitties, is here today, uh, and he's going to be more of an integral part later on in the segment. Um, and today we actually wanted to divulge into uh, a pretty controversial topic <laughs> for our first topic here, um, really about vaccines. Um, a lot of people ask about vaccination in their pets, and so we thought it would be a great sort of starter topic for our first podcast show. Yeah, so some of the controversies we do run into are whether to vaccinate pets at all, when to vaccinate them, uh, what vaccines they should receive, and what could the harmful effects be of vaccines. So, you know, the first thing to kind of talk about is what is the immune system and really how does it work? We're not gonna go crazy discussing that, but we'll just give you a little briefing about that. Yeah, so the immune system is, is an amazing thing. Um, you know, you are, and, and your pets, um, have in your bloodstream these wonderful cells called white blood cells. And any time that you are exposed to something that should not be in your body, sort of a foreign invader or what we call an antigen, um, your immune system basically forms <laughs> antibodies to fight against that antigen. It can be a bacteria or a virus, but it basically creates an army in defense of any time that, that, will, that your body will come in contact with that type of antigen again. And so um, having a strong immune system means that your immune system can build a response or build an army to things that it is exposed to. And so having, you know, um, having a good sense of why, why we need these antibodies is very important because that's exactly what vaccines do, is they help our body make these antibodies, make these fighter cells. So when we do come in contact with different antigens, we have an army to kind of go up against and fight them so we don't get sick, our army is doing its job. So kind of a big thing that I feel like a lot of people don't quite 
I think recognize the magnitude of what's going on at any one time is that your body's getting exposed to thousands and thousands of things daily, weekly, monthly, all the time. Your body is seeing something foreign and reacting against it and creating little bits of antibodies and memory against those things. So antibodies are not a bad thing. They're like a tag to say, this is a bad thing. Let's get rid of it. <clears throat> so, you know, vaccines in themselves are just adding a small amount of immunity against something very specific in addition to all of the other thousands of things that you get exposed to all the time. Yeah. So essentially what you do is when you have a vaccine inside that little vial that you've seen at your doctor's office, your vet's office, inside that vial <laughs> is either a piece of the bad guy, of the, of the antigen, or a, a type of a killed antigen, which means that it's either the bacteria or a virus in that bottle that's modified in a way that it's not gonna hurt you when it injects inside you. It's not gonna create the disease in your body. Um, and so what that does is it gives your body a small bit of that antigen to start fighting up and building up an army against. And so a lot of people talk about, you know, boostering and the need for boosters and why, why we have to booster our, our pets. Well, what happens is, is that when you give just a tiny bit of the bad guy and your immune system starts building up some army, you have a small army, but you don't have the, the big one that you need to fight the infection if you ever were to become in contact with it in the outside world. So vaccines are a great way of introducing, you know, a bad antigen or a bad pathogen to your body and allowing you to build up a natural immune response. So we were talking about a good example to make this make sense for you. And, and I think the best thing that we could think of was chicken pox. And so a lot of us have been exposed naturally to chicken pox. Yep, in the a 70s lot. and 80s, I yep. remember <laughs> the parents were like, you know, <laughs> stuffing the kids together when they all had the chicken pox so they right. would get some all at the same time. So like, so when you get that disease, the first time you've never been exposed to it before, you get sick and you get sick because the virus is causing problems and your body starts to fight it off. Your body has never seen it before, so it takes it a while it finally does mount a response. I don't know for you, it was a week yep. for me, same, uh, same about thing. a week, and then it goes away. Now, in the future, if you were to be exposed to that, you wouldn't get that illness. There's other concerns with chicken pox, maybe in adulthood, but the fundamental thing about chicken pox is that once you're exposed to it and you are sick from it, you do not get sick from it again because now your body remembers it and immediately mounts that quick response and gets rid of it before it has a chance to set hold and actually make you sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, as far as vaccines go, again, what that does is, is a, as, a, as opposed to, you know, if your brother had chicken pox back when you were little, your mom would say, okay, go, go sit with Joe and watch a movie. Go and, lick him. <laughs> go, go just touch him and give him a big <laughs> hug. Um, I remember, I clearly remember my mom, my brother got the chicken pox first and she made me and my sister just go and hang out and watch a movie. And then sure enough, all of us got the chicken pox a couple days later and we all were sick, but she got it out of the system. So what does a vaccine do? A vaccine basically, again, gives that small bit of that antigen, of that bad guy to your body or to your pet's body and allows you to build immune response. So if you got in contact with it in the outside world, the true disease, you would hopefully fight the infection and wouldn't have to worry about it. So there are some common myths though about vaccines. Um, vaccines are definitely a loaded topic. It's, it was a big, right. <laughs> big controversial topic to pick for our first podcast, but um, there are some myths. And so Krista probably has the... Well, I mean, I think the biggest thing to recognize is that vets, doctors, no one is out there saying that vaccines are 100% safe. So there's a lot of people that fight back against uh, vaccines, pr you know, promoted by doctors and vets saying, they're saying it's completely safe. We're not, there actually can be reactions that can occur to vaccines, um, very, very uncommonly, but they do. And a vaccine reaction is typically almost like an allergy to that vaccine. Um, you can also even less commonly have diseases that occur in the immune system where the immune system gets over, overreactive, we call autoimmune diseases. Um, and those things do occur, they occur very, very uncommonly. And the idea is that they occur so uncommonly that they're actually less uncommon than the disease you're trying to prevent against. So the risk of those things is worth the risk of vaccination. Yeah. I mean, the risk of incurring those problems. Right? Absolutely, 100%. <laughs> um, you know, some other common myths that people have, a lot of times they feel as though, um, you know, uh, the vaccine itself is, is, is um, if you have a small dog and a big dog, that the big dog should get 
the same amount of vaccine or should get more vaccine than a small dog. And that's actually, that is a myth as well. Inside each one of those vials, it's not a drug. The vaccine isn't a drug. It's not based on weight of an animal. It is it is in that vaccine is the actual uh, enough of that pathogen to sort of allow the immune response to, to trigger an appropriate response to that antigen. So regardless of the size of the dog, if it's a small dog or a large dog, it's again, not cat. based on, or a cat, it's not based on weight. It's based on um, immune response. And even a horse only gets a very small amount more than a cat does. Mm -hmm. um, so boosters, you know, uh, some people say there are some very strong advocates of vaccinating less that say that once an animal has received vaccines in their life, they never again need them because they have mm -hmm. enough immunity. And that really isn't true. Vaccines are going to, any animal is going to respond to a vaccine differently. So some animals will have lifelong immunity and some will only have one year immunity. Um, really, it's, it's so variable that we can't always know. And because of that, we have to protect all of the animals kind of in a similar way. Yep. Um, one interesting factoid though, is that, you know, when an animal has an appropriate am amount of antibodies present, they actually, giving them a vaccine, the antibodies that they have in their body actually go ahead and just inactivate the vaccine that you gave them. So it isn't like you're stimulating the immune system and then you're adding more and then you're adding more and then you're adding more. Your immune system is just saying, nope, we are fine, we're cool, we don't need to do any more. <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah, and I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, as far as, you know, the, the need for boosters, it is very important, and they've actually done a lot of extensive studies, you know, to show exactly what's the safest intervals that you do need to have. Um, and so these are things where we do offer some owners, if they choose not to want a booster, and they choose instead to say, well, I want to see actually how my dog's immune system is handling this. Um, we actually do offer titers on some, of those, um, on some of those diseases, where we actually take a small sample of blood, we send it out to the lab, and we're able to tell, you know, how many antibodies do they have against this particular type of disease? Are they able to fight the infection off appropriately? Um, which is a great thing. The only downside is, is that it is a little bit more expensive. And so, you know, we would do it on every single pet, except it just is a bit, uh, it's a cost prohibitive. Um, and so, and there are other diseases. Because you have to do it every year. Every year too. Instead of vaccinating perhaps every three years like you would for most diseases. Yeah, and certain diseases like rabies, you know, having titers is actually not as uh, considered safe. And so we actually don't even recommend to do titers on rabies vaccines. Um, we actually recommend to just vaccinate your pet in the appropriate intervals um, for the most, uh, to be the safest that we possibly mm -hmm. can be. So, so another myth or, or thing that we see very frequently is different recommendations being given by different groups of people. Spe specifically, we'll see you know, paperwork coming from rescue organizations or breeders saying this is what they recommend that you give versus what we're recommending that we give. And I'm not going to be somebody that's going to say I'm always right. Um, but what I will say is that um, I do kind of object at times when we have specific information saying you will not have your breeder contract valid if you give certain vaccines or a vaccine should be given at this age or this age. I'm very happy with breeders being very strong proponents of their breed and they usually know so much information about them. But I would say the best information that a breeder could give you is just to say, follow your vet's recommendations because we do follow kind of the current literature and often mm -hmm. will have information that, that your breeder or rescue might not have. Yeah. So, I, and I agree with that, you know, because even though the breeders do give a lot of great information to the clients, um, majority of the time, as far as medical knowledge and as far as vaccinations, we're not making this stuff up. This is coming from pure science and, and literature, um, and we're doing what we feel is the safest for your pet. So, then there was the issue of profits. Yes. So, we do we, hear this a lot. We do hear it a lot as veterinarians. It, strong statements that are being made by some that say vets are only giving vaccines for the profit because we either get more money from vaccine manufacturers for kickbacks for whatever. Yeah, so they how think, do you feel they about think that? manufacturers <laughs> are taking us out to dinners and cruises and giving us, you know, luxury cars. And it's just, it's not the case. Um, you know, vets. Uh, practice veterinary medicine because we love animals and we love people and you know as far as preventing diseases that's what we would 
we, we want to do, and it actually takes a little bit more time to explain why we vaccinate, why we're doing these things on a yearly basis to all of our clients. If we really wanted a good, profitable business, we would have every pet get really, really sick, and we wouldn't have vaccines for things like Parvo and things like that. Um, you know, those vaccines are really minuscule in the grand scheme of what it would cost to actually treat a pet if they got sick from something like Parvovirus, which is a very common core vaccination. Um, you know, so we do like our pets. We want all of them to be safe for you. Um, we want them all to have a happy life and that we want them to be, and you to be great members of the community. Uh, we don't want you guys to get sick. So making money off of vaccines is definitely not something that that we do. And you know, realistically, the profit margin on vaccines is extremely low. They're just drugs that we purchase. There's no such thing as, as kickbacks or, you know, I think maybe in vet school we got a pizza lunch <laughs> yeah. from a manufacturer yeah. once, you know. Um, this, these vaccines are, are fairly costly for us to purchase and we just want what's best for your pets. Yeah. So we actually have, like I said, we were going to bring him back into the segment, um, okay, so Sebastian. Sebastian needs a vaccine. He's due for a rabies vaccine. So we're not just vaccinating him for entertainment, but he's due for a vaccine. Yeah, and, and we Dr. Van thought it would be a great time, and so did I. Um, he is a pretty mellow cat. We're going to get him on out here. He's been just sleeping the whole segment, so we're, we're going to have to wake him up for this. Hey, big guy. So this hey. is Sebastian. He's about seven years old doesn't want to be here. <laughs> and so with vaccines, you'll see your vet do this quite often. Um, we use the same sort of syringes and needles that they use in, in human hospitals, sterile technique. Um, this vaccine is something that you actually have to mix and, and uh, you should do it right at the, the time of the visit. Here we go. So this is a three-year rabies vaccine um, for a kitty. Uh, you just, like I said, you mix it around. You can see the vaccine that's inside here. Um, we draw it up. And again, this is the same vaccine that you would use for, you know, a cat that's 20 pounds or a cat that's 10 pounds. It's the same vaccine. What we always do is we just kind of change out the needle before we go ahead and administer it. And that way the needle is just uh, fresh, clean, hasn't been poked you know, into the vial uh, at that so point. So it hurts less. So it hurts less. Um, where you give the vaccine, there's actually particular spots or particular areas depending on what vaccine it is. So this is a rabies vaccine. So most rabies vaccines are sort of given in the right rear. We kind of like note it that way. That way we have record if they ever have a little lump or bump that we note where we've given the vaccine before. And so what I tend to do before I give the vaccines, I kind of just rub and like get them used to me and kind of desensitize them a little bit. That way, it's not gonna be so weird when a needle goes in. And a lot of times if you just do it kind of quick, they won't even notice. We'll let Sebastian hide. So I'll rub right here so he doesn't even feel it. Rub, 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 as far down as we can go. And then a little poke and we're done. And I almost fell over. <laughs> <laughs> I don't normally do it on a chair. <clears throat> and he looked at her, but he didn't really notice so much. Yeah. I have to say, to I think for the most part, you know, cats are, cats are fairly, um, fairly good when you go ahead and give vaccines. Dogs, you can you can fool a lot of times with some treats and cookies. Um, but most of the time, you know, pets sort of tolerate their vaccines just, just fine. So another little segment that we thought we would try would be to kind of highlight a breed or species of animal and just kind of go over what is entailing the care of those animals. So cats are a good one to start with. Cats are uh, considered to be sort of like that easy kind of animal to get as a pet, right? It's but true, I mean, because you don't have to walk a cat three times a day, which is always a, always <laughs> a plus. Um, you know, you can have a cat be litter box trained, which is really nice. Um, cats, for the most part, they, they sleep a lot. They're good cuddle bugs. <laughs> um, so they definitely can be a very good or easy pet. Um, but there are some things, you know, cats do require some stimulation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in general, cats can be solitary very happily, but they do kind of get into some trouble behaviorally and medically if you don't play with them, if you don't give them fun times, especially when they're in that younger, like yeah. one to eight years of age. Um, 
they usually can get a cat either as a kitten or as an adult at a shelter is the most frequent. Some yep. people do go with breeds, full, full breed cats. Sebastian here is just what we would call a domestic short hair. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just a mixed breed cat. And uh, they typically, you can choose whether you have your cat indoor or outdoor. <clears throat> most veterinarians do recommend that for the health of the cats as well as for the local wildlife, that they stay indoors. And most kittens can be trained to be an indoor cat and be very happy. But again, you do have to play pretty extensively with them to keep you them do. occupied. And, and cats are very funny. I mean, even though there are lots of breeds of cats, I feel like majority of the time people will have just you know, your good old standard domestic short hair, domestic long hair, or <laughs> domestic medium hair um, cats. And so are just sort of regular, you know, good old tabby cats. And they're great and they're fantastic, but they can have a wide variety of personalities. So you can get some kitties that definitely need uh, a little bit more, you know, human contact or a little bit more uh, entertainment and play. And so there are a wide variety of toys you can get at pet stores, cat trees. Um, they have the fun, like, bird feeding boxes where it kind of fits in your window they can sit there and watch the birds come in um, you know different types of toys feather toys little mouse toys um, so there are a lot of options out there to make sure that you're having fun with your cat and keeping your cat stimulated um, for multiple cats you know some people do really feel like cats enjoy having other house companions that sometimes can be a little bit challenging because cats are not always very happy to have another cat in their house um, so we do see I would say a fairly significant number of behavior problems that happen when we mag when we add many cats. So two cats, fine, three cats, getting a little <laughs> crazy and more problems with more cats. However, many cats do live, you know, happily together. Um, One of the biggest pieces of advice too that I give to um, people that own kid cats, you know, is to try not to change up their litter too much either or try to like, you know, get whatever's on sale at the store. Um, cats can be very, very particular about the type of litter substrate that they use. Um, and if you are changing it on a frequent basis or, you know, using stuff that they might not be used to texture wise, things like that, you can actually run into a lot of problems with litter box training. Um, but for the most part, cats are great with using litter box. And so, um, you know, it, it is a, a really good, easy, clean pet to have. Yeah, and feeding is reasonably easy as well. You know, we do usually recommend meal feeding cats, you know, putting down food for them to eat in one in a meal, um, dry or wet. Another thing that you don't want to change up frequently because you can run into both behavioral and, and medical problems when you do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the final thing I, I guess I would say medically with cats is that there's a little bit of this myth that cats don't need to ever go to the vet. We're here as vets to say that Gosh, when you see a cat that hasn't been to the vet in 10 years, yep. how many problems do they often have that you could have treated? It's true, and I yeah. mean, some of the treatments really aren't that you know overwhelming or overbearing, and I feel like a lot of times people get worried that they think that they're gonna be signing themselves up for this massive undertaking. A lot of it is just some you know good basic things to know. Um, and Heart murmurs, yeah, you know, dental disease, I mean. Early, early kidney disease that you can detect early. Like um, simple things like changing obesity. up their- Obesity. <laughs> yeah, which is very common with the indoor guys. Um, so, you know, I think coming to see the vet is a really important thing. We can give you guys tips and, and make sure that your kitty is nice and healthy and that there's nothing going on that would need to be addressed. And like I said, it can be as easy as something like changing up, you know, a particular type of food to, you know, maybe getting their teeth cleaned or having a bad tooth being pulled. So, um, you know, don't forget, we love to see the kitties too. Make sure they stay healthy for you. So that's our little snapshot on cats. Well, thank you for joining us for our very first podcast in studio segment. Uh, we're very excited that we could bring this to you and we hope that this was something that you enjoyed. We would love to hear back from you about comments or uh, ideas that you have for future segments. So please feel free to email us and let us know. And until next time, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Bye.